One of the attractive things about Second Life at the moment is it's a place where we can play with the design of the space uh, so that we can understand how people can learn effectively. We're taking Second Life as a basis. Uh, we're extending it. We're adding measurement tools in there. And we're taking that data off world to look at how communities are formed and maintained. Are there positive things about that for, for some young people? that might be better compared to more traditional environments. The Interlife project team has developed 3D private islands in Second Life in order to help young people who are gifted and talented and looked after and accommodated. The project aims to harness the power of a virtual world to help young people develop social skills and navigate difficult transitions in their lives. Professor Vic Lally of the University of Glasgow leads the project with other team members based at Glasgow, Stirling, Sheffield and Heriot Watt Universities. In the research community that we're using with Interlife, our hope is that we're not going to be just disseminating knowledge, but the kids are going to construct knowledge. The kids in Derbyshire are very interested in making films depicting a problem with vulnerability at a point of transition in their life. Think of bullying, teasing, taunting, betrayal. And then a bunch of kids meet with their avatars on the island, and what they could do is use the film as a stimulus, and they'd say, all right, that's the problem. How can we fix it? All we're doing is providing them with the space, providing them with the opportunity, so these kids can make a contribution. The space is easy to co-construct. Young people can have control over the space, manage their own interactions, and learn. This is a kind of exhibition area where students were putting up uh, boards that represented images of themselves, favourite activities, statements about themselves, to get students talking about themselves. What we've done is uh, set up a, a monitoring system so that the text that's typed in and the position at which people are standing on the island is actually logged. You can then take those logs or summaries of them back to the participants and say to them, what was going on there? You know, pick out what I call critical incidents. They'll offer some explanation stimulated by the log. So when you put together the volume of messages, an analysis of what people are saying, and the recall stimulated by that, that people offer when you take stuff back to them, you get a rich picture of, uh, of interaction. So it's, it's a social research laboratory for us. The data is showing an effect of a process of engagement as a sort of community. So the asymmetry between the traditional pedagogue and the, the learner, in a sense, has been balanced, if not reversed. There's a fluid leadership. We have to step back and allow the young people to organise their own events, self-regulate the environment, and it results in a sort of social construction of knowledge and a mutual respect and understanding between the young people. This is a place which offers them activities and freedoms that they can carry out in world and relate to each other in a way that perhaps they feel constrained in, uh, in their real environment. It has enhanced the, the profile of the role of technology and learning, especially in young people that perhaps would disengage with the traditional curriculum. And that's because of emotions and the engagement and their motivation to come in world or into Interlife Island and work in a creative, collaborative fashion. The Interlife project takes an interdisciplinary approach with team members offering expertise in computer science, sociology and psychology. Naturally, the research needs to offer insights to all team members, whatever their discipline. We've been looking at ways of visualising the data using um, online software that's open source, freely available. Now, Evan's been doing the scripting, and I, and I know he's playing around with social network analysis in other research contexts. But he's using this project to drive the development of that software. But m for me, that the development of that software is something that I'm using to... Uh, visualise educational data and write educational papers. He's using it for a different purpose. We both know that, <laughs> but it works, you know. We have a particular interest in handheld, portable handheld devices to interact with that world on the go 24-7. To, I suppose, grey in a sense, the boundary between the in-world 
and out of world. When you have a virtual world, you want people to be aware of what's going on in there. And if you can only be there when you're at a computer, it's rather limited. So we want a mobile portable device that will allow people to interact with what's going on in world while they're sitting on a bus. We're working with some uh, youngsters locally here in Glasgow. Some of them are really quite reflective about it and, uh, and are aware of the impact that involvement has had on their understanding of their own aspirations. I mean, for example, one of the youngsters we've been working with in Derbyshire um, recently said he now wants to study computer science at university. You know, never talked about, never talked about career aspiration, never talked about university, never used that vocabulary before. And you can see there's an interaction between the way they're developing real-world skills and the stuff that they're doing in, in Interlife. <laughs>